Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Joel Benjamin, and you are watching and listening to ICC's Game of the Week. I'd like to do something a bit different this week. Today's game will spotlight an amateur player who knocked off a top grandmaster with an opening variation that represents one of the greatest achievements for amateurs in history. There are a few nice stories associated with this game, so let me set the stage for you. The chess community has come together to try to avert a human tragedy for one of its members. Serbian GM Dusan Popovic is in desperate need of kidney transplants and cannot afford the hefty price tag for the operation. Magnus Carlsen stepped in to give a benefit simul on ICC, while grandmasters from Vichy Anand to the commentary team at ICC contributed to the kitty. Among celebrity competitors like Howard Stern, a little known player stole the show by knocking off Carlsen easily and efficiently. At first, there were the usual suspicions of cheating, but everything made sense when people realized the vanquisher of Carlsen, Hans Joachim Hofstetter, is a correspondence grandmaster. Encyclopedic knowledge of somewhat esoteric openings is par for the course in the correspondence milieu. Hofstetter knew the subtleties of the Dilworth attack, a revolutionary discovery back in the early 1940s by the English correspondence player and railway clerk, Vernon Dilworth. Now in the small world category, Dilworth actually played on a team in 1980 with ICC honcho John Chess FM Henderson. Now if you never put time into analyzing the Dilworth, you're not going to figure it out over the board, especially in a simul. Marvelous Magnus found that out the hard way. Let's see how it happened. Okay, so we have Magnus Carlson White against Hans Joachim Hofstetter playing black. And as advertised, it's a Dilworth. That's a variation of the Roy Lopez, the open variation, named as such because the center is open, black plays instead of bishop e7, knight takes e4. And after bishop e6, we have the main starting point from the uh, uh, the open variation, and here, uh, nowadays the most popular move is knight bd2, and usually black plays knight c5, c3, and white can play this move order because black isn't necessarily going to take that bishop and allow white's uh, knight to come to b3 and white to develop quickly. Um, but another reason why uh, the knight bd2 has become very popular is to avoid what happens here. Uh, besides knight bd2, another way to do it is bishop e3, and I think that these moves are today the most popular lines for white. But uh, Magnus played c3, which is a traditional main line, to bishop c5, knight bd2, castles, and bishop c2. And now, in this position, black has a variety of moves. Uh, bishop f5 is one of them, pawn to f5, and even knight takes d2 is quite playable here. But really the most challenging move, and the move that a lot of uh, people like to avoid, is the Dilworth, knight takes f2. Black sacrifices some material, white is going to get two pieces for a rook, and uh, black uh, just starts off with the one pawn, and a lot of variations picks up a second pawn. Well, the Dilworth really presents white with a number of mines to navigate, and you know, at the end of the road, it isn't even clear that white can claim an advantage. That's what, one reason why so many players steer clear of this opening. It really just isn't worth the hassle, and I tell you, I would never, certainly never allow this position in the simul. Uh, well, okay, you know, it's certainly sporting to do so, but it's pretty hard to figure it all out. And black plays f6, uh, forcing open that f file, and uh, white almost always takes on f6, because otherwise black will just gain a pawn there, 
And now is a good moment to take the rook, forcing the king into the game. And queen takes f6. And here Magnus played knight f1. Um, the other main move in the position is uh, king to g1. Uh, after rook a e8, uh, knight f1, knight e5, and bishop e3. Definitely not knight takes e5, queen f2 check, and mate on the back rank. That's a little trap, a certain, certainly a very little one, but uh, there are a number of them in this opening. Uh, bishop e3. And this is actually leads to a position that, that could have been reached later on in the game. There are a few transpositional uh, possibilities, so I'm going to deal with that one later. So knight to f1. And black starts uh, piling up on this knight on f3. Knight e5. Bishop e3. Rook a e8. And this is really kind of... Uh, Kind of a starting point for a lot of uh, games in the Dilworth. Here, um, Carlson plays bishop d4. Let's consider the alternatives. As I mentioned, king g1 is one of them getting out of the pin, and that virtually forces black to head into an endgame by uh, trading on f3. And black gets that second pawn, so the material is uh, is pretty much about even. White has the bishop pair, which can swing the game in his uh, direction. The problem is um, that um, White is very often White very often gets kind of tied up here. And um, after Rook takes f3, uh, the most common continuation begins bishop f2. There are other moves, but uh, the bishop on e3 is not very safe. The knight on f1 can't move until it goes. And after bishop h3, see what I mean about being tied up. White's king is now stuck on the back rank, and there are occasionally back rank issues, mating issues that he has to deal with. So bishop h3, knight g3, g6, kind of taking some activity away from both the knight and the bishop. Rook to d1, c6, just defending the pawn. Rook D, rook D2, and this represents very a common continuation. These the, those, the last few moves are certainly far from forced. White maybe will play uh, bishop to D1 to trade the rook, or sometimes bishop comes back to D1 and F1 to, to either trade or chase away the bishop. Of course, if white gets uh, an ending with a knight and a bishop against the rook and pawns, rather than two bishops against the rook and pawns, that's not nearly as favorable. And a lot of these types of end games, with some slight differences in the placement of the pieces, uh, have occurred over the years. And it's not at all easy for White to demonstrate anything in, in those positions. Uh, another important move here is bishop to c5. And this could uh, be argued to be the main line, at least from, you know, games that have been played in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, and the idea is that bishop on e3 is really kind of exposed, and uh, white likes to pick up his tempo with the bishop c5, get the bishop uh, to a safer place. So after bishop c5, knight takes f3, threatening discovered check, so white really has to take with the pawn. Rook f7, king to g2. And it's also possible to play king g1 and gambit the f3 pawn is uh, perhaps a slightly better version for white than, than the other one because the bishop is not hanging on e3. But again, it's a pretty difficult end game to try to win. So after king g2, um, we have some uh, very interesting possibility for black. I think it was discovered by uh, Gregory uh, Kaidanov, who over the years has been a, a kind of a master of the uh, open uh, variation in the Roy Lopez for black. And his idea was d4. This is a clearance sacrifice, really, to get the bishop uh, some more uh, open lines to play with. And so bishop takes d4, queen g5, check. 
And now knight g3 is kind of forced. If king h1, bishop d5, bishop b3, now there's no bishop takes f3 because white will take it, the rook is pinned. But instead, uh, c5, and, well, if that bishop goes to f2, c4 is uh, quite strong. So usually bishop e3, bishop takes b3, bishop takes g5, bishop takes d1, rook takes d1, rook takes f3. And here black has a, well, he's only, he's only got one pawn, but may actually be a better than average um, version of, of this endgame because it's pretty hard to keep a black rook off the seventh rank. And uh, so black is uh, doing pretty well. Uh, you know, note that some positions favor rooks, you know, more than minor pieces. Here, uh, white does not have pawns in the center, doesn't have outposts to anchor those minor pieces, and there's a lot of open files for the rooks to play with. So this kind of position could be better for the rooks than a lot of other positions with two pieces against a rook can be. Uh, it all depends on the position. So in this line again, bishop c5, knight takes f3, pawn takes, rook f7, king g2, d4, bishop takes d4, queen g5. Here, knight g3 is uh, the, the usual move. And now c5, bishop f2, rook takes f3. Kind of a explosive move there. And uh, if, um, well, if queen takes rook, bishop d5 is uh, winning the queen. White is, can interpose, but black just takes it and takes advantage of the pin of the knight. So we have king takes f3, bishop g4, king g2, and black takes on d1. Position is uh, probably about equal. And uh, the first instance I found was, again, Kudrin against Kaidanov from U.S. Championship in 1997. Come to think of it, I have happy memories of that U.S. Championship. That was one of the ones I, uh, I won. Uh, but um, cool opening idea for Kaidanov. And after rook takes f3, I think that I also found here bishop e4, bishop h3 check, king takes uh, bishop, rook takes f2, queen d5. That forces an end game suppose king f8, and here again, one of these end games with rook against two pieces, black has one extra pawn here, as opposed to two, but uh, has the rook on the seventh rank. So again, uh, an end game that could uh, really, uh, any of three uh, results are possible. Well, after all that prelude, we now get to uh, the game with uh, move bishop to d4. And that's a, that's a move that's been played several times as well. Bishop to d4, and now bishop g4, putting further pressure on f3. And here Carlson plays knight on one to d2. If he takes on e5 right away, after rook takes e5, there could be some trouble. Knight one d2, now the move queen b6 check kind of pins the white king in the center. After king f1, rook h5, h3, uh, now here, actually, bishop takes h3, pawn takes, and now the best move, rook g5. This seems to be good enough to provide a winning attack. Black is getting ready to check on g1. Pretty hard to avoid. But actually, the computer move, very funny, rook e8, moving off the uh, open file, threatening rook takes h3 without any good defense, is immediately winning for black. A terribly important variation, but kind of uh, amusing. So better is knight 1d2 as played. And here black has tried uh, various queen moves, queen h4 check, qu uh, queen f4 also. Uh, after queen h4 check, interesting possibility, king g1, knight takes f3, knight takes f3, queen h5, queen f1, rook takes f3. Pawn takes, bishop takes f3, threatening queen g4, rook e2, mayhem to follow bishop f2 to block on the diagonal. 
And now rook e2, bishop d1, queen g5 check. And the game ended in a perpetual check. This was Grunfeld against uh, Mikulevsky from the uh, uh, Israeli championship 1992. That was actually A. Mikulevsky. I think that's the father of Viktor Mikulevsky, which, who is the top grandmaster, top Israeli grandmaster now. Um, and we've actually profiled him before in this show. Both father and son played played many games in the open Roy Lopez. But in this game, it was queen g5. Bishop takes e5. Queen takes e5. King g1. Queen check. King h1. Queen f2. Well, here, white is getting very tied up. He's got weaknesses, you know, in his first rank, and it's particularly his second rank. Black is very, very active with the rooks, and it's already getting difficult for white to play. But still, it seems that white can be okay with an accurate move. And he's got to start with bishop to b3. This move is important because um, you got to get the bishop off the second rank where it's hanging and hit this pawn on d5. And after c6, white can play queen g1 to... Uh, trade the queens off the board. For instance, rook e2, rook f1, queen g1, uh, king g1. And here white might even be better um, with the two pieces for the uh, uh, rook and pawn. If bishop takes f3, knight takes f3, rook takes b2, knight d4, white will start to get some of those pawns back. Uh, either the c pawn or the d pawn is uh, going to have to be returned. So we get a typically unclear uh, ending. Um, but, uh, you know, once again, um, white doesn't seem to be able to get much better than that, <laughs> you know, uh, in this uh, Dilworth. Uh, very tough open to deal with. And bishop b3 certainly seems to be clearly the best try for white because other moves can certainly lead into danger. Um, if uh, a move like uh, queen f1 or queen g1 right away, black has rook takes f3, uh, taking advantage of the fact that bishop on c2 is hanging. So bishop d3 was played, and rook e3, and now Carlson needed to play bishop to f1 to try to defend. But on the other hand, after that move, it's very, very difficult for white to move anything. And uh, I think that, um, you know, black um, is going to get ready to, to create some threats. And uh, I would not want to play white here. But actually, the move that he played, queen f1, black seizes upon some kind of typical Dilworth tactics with rook takes f3. Of course, if queen takes queen, rook takes queen. So white takes with a knight on f3. Well, if white takes with a pawn, there's queen takes uh, knight. So knight hanging is a problem. So knight takes. And Carlson, the best he can do really is to try to force this endgame. Which uh, Hofstetter allows, because he is a pawn up here. And we're just down to the technical phase. Now, very often, uh, you know, the grandmasters, especially in simuls, they can slime their way out of difficulties um, by, you know, getting their opponent uh, in the end game. But of course, Black is a veteran player, and uh, he seemed to be able to handle this part okay. So we saw both sides centralizing the kings. Bishop c8, I'm not sure if that move was necessary, but it doesn't seem to hurt anything. So the black king is looking to penetrate one way or the other into the game. And now g6. Well, in bishops end games, you generally don't want to put your pawns on the same color as the bishop. Uh, and here, black has a whole host of them on light squares. 
but the, the move g6 here has a has a benefit in that uh, black wants to have this option of playing bishop to f5 and that chases the bishop off the blockading square and creates possibilities uh, for the, the black to penetrate with his king. And um, in, in a lot of different positions, white simply runs out of moves. He plays b4, trying to fix the, uh, the queenside pawns on those slight squares to be target for the bishop. Nice little waiting move, bishop h3, so that if uh, white moves the bishop, then the black king will be able to penetrate to e4 or c4. So white moves the king, and now bishop to f5, driving away the bishop. And the king comes to e4. And, well, this h-pawn advances because it's going to be a candidate for queening in a couple of moves. So he's getting it forward for the race. Again, white really is kind of in zugzwang here. Bishop d1 to, to try to, sorry, to try to keep the f3 square covered. d3 again, zugzwang. And, uh, well, pretty much after that, the game is over. White has to give ground. The king comes in. Bishop d5, bishop e4. And that ensures entry into the king side. And black will eat those pawns. White gets something on the queen side. But um, it's really no race at all. Uh, for instance, bishop takes b5, h4, bishop d7, g5, followed by g4, h3, h2, h1, queen, and uh, it's all over. So uh, after black uh, ate that uh, second pawn, uh, Magnus Carlsen acknowledged that uh, the game belonged to his opponent. So uh, kind of an interesting game there. Um, you know, you don't uh, necessarily, uh, you know, pay so much attention to um, simul games. But here there are uh, a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I like to draw attention to the, the fact that uh, this uh, grandmaster colleague, Dusan Popovich, needs help from a lot of people in the, in the world to, uh, to uh, try to get that kidney transplant he needs. And also, the, you know, to show that the, you know, correspondence players are often not very well known to the general public, but they know a lot of things that can be very tricky and can really, uh, you know, trip up even a, a top-level grandmaster uh, should the opp opportunity be presented. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending, and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right, and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net, and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.